So I'm going to give you a little bit of a different perspective today. I want to uh, sort of bring you into uh, the future a little bit more and also from our point of view as a manufacturer. So uh, let's start there. So what's the background? The, the interesting points often mentioned by the other speakers Population is going to increase, we know that. We know that there's going to be more people who are going to uh, try and join the middle class, as we would like to call it here. And that means that they're going to want to enjoy the, the goods and services that we all enjoy in Western Europe, uh, for example, today. Actually, greenhouse gases still uh, pro projected to increase, even though we've had the Paris Agreement. But this is another big one that's cropping up more and more now, is air quality. So we see the air qualities. And these four pictures here are of uh, iconic uh, uh, cities within Europe. They're not made up photographs, they're real things. So this is the same as we heard in Beijing and China during the Olympic Games. And of course, there are other impacts as well, where our ecosystems are really being degraded now by the impacts of man. And one of those is water, as you can see there. Okay, so you can imagine why I've used this theme. We've been trying to engage with the members in, in our company, uh, both at shop floor level, but also at the level of uh, uh, senior management as well. So we wanted to try and understand why we wanted to call it, uh, that what we were facing with these challenges. And uh, the Mission Impossible theme seemed quite relevant, but it was particularly relevant because uh, Uchi Yamada-san, who was the responsible person for uh, promoting the Prius, which was the first uh, 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 hybrid vehicle that was available to the world, he uh, got a mission from his top management to say, make the 21st century car, no other guidance. So he had to go back, he had to make a vision, and he decided that he had to make the impossible possible. So indeed, that's what we tried to do. And this is the challenge that we received. And you can see here, I'll read it just very quickly. To go beyond zero environmental impact and achieve a net positive impact. Toyota has set itself six challenges. All of these challenges, whether in climate change or resource and water recycling, are beset with difficulties. However, we are committed to continuing towards the year 2050 with steady initiatives in order to realize sustainable development together with society. And these are the co key words for me. Go beyond zero, achieve a net positive, which is the first time we've actually managed to say that. And <clears throat> we've also, uh, with these six challenges, we've recognized they're very difficult challenges. And we don't hold all of the cards in our own hand. We can't achieve this as an individual car manufacturer. And indeed, as an individual sector, we can't solve all of those problems that I put up on the first slide. But we are committed. We are really committed to trying to do something. We will go at it step by step, steady way. This is the Toyota way. And we need to engage with the rest of society. We need to engage with our customers. We need to engage with the fuel companies, with governments, with NGOs, everybody. And that's what we're going to try and do, make the uh, mission uh, actually possible. So what are the six challenges? So very briefly, the six challenges. The first one is a new vehicle CO, uh, zero CO2 emissions challenge. You know that uh, under TRIPE approval, every car has to have a CO2 label. Uh, the average that uh, uh, we actually uh, are allowed to emit is decreasing year by year within the European Union. But globally, we want to go towards uh, zero. And what does that actually mean? We have a hard target in this area. We want to achieve 90% reduction in CO2 uh, by 2050 based upon a 2010 uh, baseline. So that's our own baseline. Why 90%? Honestly, this is based in the science. This comes from the COP uh, discussions. And you will understand if you go through all of those numbers and pro pro process it out from the, uh, uh, for the transport sector, this is the contribution that transport should make. And how are we going to achieve that? Well, today we're selling uh, gasoline and de diesel vehicles largely in the world. Of course, we are the world's leader in hybrid vehicles as well. But what do we see in the future? We see that uh, uh, <coughs> there is going to be a steady increase in those alternative fueled vehicles. So in terms of hybrid, plug-in hybrid, fuel cell vehicles, and indeed electric vehicles as well. So that's how we're going to respond to that. This is our idea of our drivetrain strategy going forward. 
So in the middle there, you will see that we've got passenger cars. Uh, they're the ones that we are seeing mostly today. But in cities, because of this urbanisation, we believe that congestion is going to demand that the car's footprint will be smaller physically uh, within the city and uh, smaller vehicles, possibly in car sharing and uh, uh, personal mobility vehicles will start to increase. And largely, we believe that these are really ideal to be electric vehicles. They're, they're going to be short distances. They're going to be have uh, more opportunities to recharge. For the passenger cars, we see a proliferation of uh, uh, hybrid vehicles still and plug-in hybrids, and then gradually moving into fuel cell vehicles. So I will explain a little bit uh, more about fuel cell vehicles earlier, uh, later, sorry. And uh, physically, we have the first uh, publicly available saloon car, uh, which is fuel cell uh, operated, and we're now starting to sell that within Europe. For bigger vehicles, really fuel cells start to take over at that point in time. For long distances where they can uh, uh, pick up, their, these vehicles are on the road virtually 24 hours a day in many circumstances, long haul trucks, etc. Actually, what have we done to contribute so far? Well, we've sold 9 million hybrids in the world right now. And uh, if we calculate that out on an average, that's around 62 million tonnes of CO2 that's been saved. Uh, but we're proud to say that even within Europe, which is not a particularly large market for Toyota, we've sold 1.4 million hybrids already, and uh, that's just short of 10 million tonnes uh, of CO2. And you can see there that we are still regarded as the leader in the hybrid drivetrain. So if we look back over the, the fa past five-year uh, action plan, what did we manage to achieve? Well, actually, our new vehicle CO2 average within Europe is now at 108 grams, well, when that's compared to a target of 130. So when people were talking about going beyond, that's what we mean by going beyond. This is, not, this is voluntary where we've gone to with this. And a hybrid mix now is increasing steadily. So at the moment, we have Lexus at 64%. Actually, in the UK, it's 100%. You cannot buy a conventionally uh, driven hybrid uh, from the Lexus range uh, in the UK. And Toyota's at 21. But if I already look at this year's figures uh, since uh, Christmas, you will see that, that this is in excess of 30% this year. So it's increasing. What does that mean? We're bringing out new vehicles. So that's the new RAV4, which is available for the first time in hybrid form, the CHR, which will be built in uh, Turkey, and the new Prius, which is already available. On the Lexus side, you can see there, that's the RX uh, one. They have their uh, uh, equivalent uh, hybrid drive. But in the future, we're going to see this. This is the uh, fuel cell vehicle. That we call it the Mirai. Mirai in Japanese actually means future. So uh, that's why we've called it that. This, this vehicle will stand on this uh, recharging area. It will be refueled in the same period of time that you would normally fill a gasoline car. It'll only take three to five minutes. <coughs> that fuel station there is actually located at our R&D center. It's a public station, so we're encouraging now other ma manufacturers to use this as, a, a, as an infrastructure. Uh, and in, indeed, the local bus company, we're trying to get them to use that as well. And that's been built in partnership, again, with uh, uh, another third party. But also in the future, we imagine this type of vehicle. These two vehicles that you can see in the middle and on the left here is, uh, are two vehicles which are in a public trial at Grenoble at the moment. So if you want to go to Grenoble, please go and have a drive of these vehicles. They're on a car share, you register, you book it by uh, iPhone or uh, uh, smartphone, and you're able to drive those. And in the future, we're going to see this type of thing for a plug-in hybrid as well. We're car parks with, uh, equipped with uh, um, solar panels on the roof so that when they're parked, they're in the shade, they don't get overly hot, but also they will start to charge themselves up. But if you see uh, the new range of the plug-in hybrid, the top of the range actually has a solar panel built into the car as well. So physically, uh, we calculate that there'll be over a thousand kilometers worth of uh, energy will be harvested per year uh, from, from the sun just by leaving your car parked outside. Challenge two, slightly different. So this is where we go into the bigger picture that we uh, have been discussing over the last couple of days, and that's the life cycle zero to the CO2. So this is all of the other areas other than the, uh, the vehicle product, its, uh, uh, product design itself. 
So this includes all of the materials that come from our suppliers, from the raw materials through to our factories, the logistics of getting the car to the uh, uh, customer themselves, what happens during the lifetime, the servicing of it, how the driver actually drives the car, because of course that has a huge impact on the fuel economy, and uh, also what happens at the end of its life as well. Deliberately, we've excluded uh, the manufacturing phase for a different reason. I'll come back to that in a few seconds. But this will be also include different types of materials. Maybe we'll be thinking much more about biomaterials, for example, where there is a CO2 benefit. What sort of uh, parts can we uh, reuse, for example, as well? So this is our uh, uh, life cycle approach uh, and LCA uh, compared to the uh, new Mirai. Mirai. You can see here on the left hand, uh, uh, this, this graph here is, is the gasoline vehicle, hybrid vehicle, and Mirai. And you can see that the area within the, the dotted box actually is the largest impact of a conventional vehicle. And this is the driving phase. This is where the fuel is coming from and how you are driving during the, the, the life of the vehicle. And you can see by progressing to a hybrid vehicle, you reduce that. So the impact on CO2 is quite clear within the life cycle. When we move to the Mirai, you can see that actually during the driving phase, there is no uh, CO2 emitted. It only emits water vapor. So the only portion there is whether there is uh, energy and CO2 emitted when we're making the hydrogen. So today, a lot of hydrogen is made by uh, reprocessing or reforming uh, natural gas, for example. But if we consider uh, high, um, renewable energies making that CO2, physically that will drop down to zero. So we have, we're opening the door, realistically, for the use phase to be truly zero if we've got uh, uh, zero CO2 uh, hydrogen. However, what it does do is it highlights the other sections of the life cycle, which we're now going to have to tackle. They become disproportionately large to where they've been before. And you can see their material and the vehicle production phase and also end of life phase become more and more important. So, our new vehicle. Our new vehicle is the Mirai. And you can see here, this is uh, the, the vehicle as we've got. Uh, designed. It's working with a, a fuel cell. The fuel cell's been under develop for development in Toyota for 20 years. So this is not something we just dreamt up last week or something like that. It's part of our strategy long term. You can see the fuel cell stack there is already at a, a high uh, de power density, making, meaning that the, uh, the device is relatively small for the power output, and we're at the world's top level there. And also for the tanks uh, where we're storing the hydrogen, they're also at a world top level where we can uh, actually minimize the size and also the weight of those tanks to uh, contain the hydrogen. Those tanks uh, that you can see at the top, those are the dimensions, that's the weight of them. They're quite heavy. They are containing gas at 700 bar. So they are very strong, as you can imagine. And they use basically a, a former and then a carbon fiber wrapped around, and then there's a, glass, a reinforced plastic as a, a protection shield uh, for, against accident damage uh, on, on top of that. <clears throat> All of these components, though, are contributing to the world leading performance of the car, but actually, paradoxically, they're starting to use materials which we've now got to take much more care of. So, for example, the fuel cell stack includes a platinum carbon fiber. It's not the easiest of materials to recycle today. Here's uh, uh, an impact that we've shown here on the various uh, material production areas and what have you. You can see by using these materials, actually, there is high embodied energy in carbon fiber and uh, uh, platinum. So we've got to do some additional work now to consider how we reduce the impact of the, uh, uh, of the material phase. <clears throat> So actually what we're going to be looking at is moving over to using other materials as well to lighten the car, possibly with aluminium. And this is an important fact here, which Mark didn't mention uh, this morning, but actually he was talking about making uh, of aluminium. But the, where the raw material is coming from to go into those casting machines and smelters is very, very important. If it's virgin aluminium, it's going to be a much higher energy content than uh, the uh, recycled material because of the way that uh, aluminium is liberated from bauxite. So we need to take some additional measures, basically, in these areas. So moving on to plant zero CO2 emissions challenge. So as I mentioned, 
we've separated this out because, honestly speaking, it's a big chunk of our uh, CO2 um, that we can control very directly by our own actions. So we're going to try and achieve zero CO2 in our factories by 2050. That's our, our, our deadline. And how are we going to achieve that? Well, it's by a number of different items, but one is to design our equipment uh, in what we call simple and slim. So we don't want to over-automate. We don't want to put high energy uh, processes into our plants unless it is really necessary. But the second measure is actually to think about where that energy is coming from. So is that energy coming from renewable sources or is it coming from fossil fuels, for example? And the challenge there can be, we can imagine quite easily how we can decarbonize electricity, but how do we decarbonize natural gas? We use natural gas in ovens for in the painting shop, for example. One possible method is actually to use hydrogen in this area as well. And hydrogen therefore becomes uh, a new currency, shall we say, within the world of CO2. So what are we doing at the moment? You can see the top left there. It's simple equipment. The equipment there, the, the conveyor belt, is, is basically using gravity. We don't need any motors on there. The, the guys put the parts on there, they feed down automatically. No, no, no need for anything else. A lot of effort going into uh, member training to make sure that the members, not only uh, engineers, but also the, the members who are uh, involved in maintenance and also involved in production, they're the guys who really know the equipment very well, and they can find the possible areas we can actually reduce energy. Also, if we're very successful with this one, we can do the bottom one at the left-hand side. And this one has a real uh, bit of poignancy for me. I remember when that convoy was going in the other direction, bringing those boilers into Toyota UK at the uh, construction phase. 20, 25 years later, we're taking them out the other way because we no longer need them. We've done enough Kaizen. We've do, worked a lot in the paint shop, meaning we don't need steam anymore. We can remove the boilers, so we've eliminated a process there. And actually, good news, those boilers actually went to uh, uh, either Pakistan or India for reuse in, a, in another factory because we looked after them so well. In terms of renewable energy, this is a, a picture of the Burniston site uh, from the air. You can see the, the big shiny bit in the middle is a five megawatt or around about five megawatt uh, uh, facility there for uh, solar power, uh, developed in conjunction with British Gas Solar. They made the investment, we get the electricity onto our site. And uh, the one in the middle there is, is where we start to think about energy effective equipment. And the, the example I brought there is LED lighting. It can have a dramatic effect in a big factory where you have many, many lights. But there's another reason I put it here as well. I'm not sure many of you will realize, but the, the person or the two professors who actually uh, invented the blue LED were sponsored by Toyota and Toyota Gosai, which is a group company. Blue was important because we already had red and green. Red, green, and blue, we've got white. White means we've got uh, uh, lighting that we can use in a, in a human environment rather than just for flashing on the front of a modem, for example. They got the Nobel Prize, by the way, for physics last year. Challenge four is about water. So in certain areas of the world, certain areas where we're actually operating as well, there is water stress. And believe it or not, that even includes the southeast of uh, England and uh, Belgium. But just we've had the rainiest uh, June on record in, in Belgium, so maybe uh, not so relevant this year. What are we doing here? It's the same strategy as with energy, basically. One is don't use it. Make sure that we're re reducing the amount of water that we, uh, we actually need to take from the grid. And also then to consider where's the water coming from? That's an important aspect. So what are we doing? So top right, and water reduction, making sure that we're turning things off, we haven't got leaks. Water is particularly difficult because it comes in a pipe and goes out in a pipe. You don't see it, generally speaking. You have no idea what the volume is. We tried to visualize it at one point in time. When we started at uh, TMUK, we were using 7.1 meters cubed of water per car. That means a, a, a petrol tanker for three cars. So if you imagine we're building a car, one a minute, then we've got three tankers that need to go past our Weybridge every minute. You know, if you start to visualize it, then you realize what the hell are we, are we doing with all of that water? What we do in our processes, we try to use the water again and again. So this process up at the top, the phosphate process, is basically a cascade. 
car is dirty at one end and progressively gets cleaner as it's washed, but the water goes back the other direction uh, so that we reutilize the water uh, a lot. These two pieces of equipment on the left-hand side are ultrafiltration and reverse osmosis. Very simple technologies, but used well can make sure that we recycle the water on, that we are using and put, return it back to the process without having to throw it away. This process here is an interesting one for TMMF. It's a plant in France. We are collecting rainwater. We're collecting rainwater from this car park that you can just see in the background, storing it in a tank and putting it into, uh, into the process. And believe it or not, we're able to clean that water sufficiently that it can go into the painting process, the most pr quality critical process within the uh, car making process, uh, which uses water. And uh, What's happened here, uh, one year, last year, they managed only 12 shifts did they have to buy any water for process use. All of the other 230 minus 12 shifts were uh, running from rainwater or recycled water. So uh, we think that's pretty good. And again, we've got some possibility of working with nature as well here because we can use uh, natural ways of cleaning up water. So. Energy and water, what does that mean? So uh, physically speaking, this is our results since 2001 to 2015, just to add a little bit there. So all of our factories added together in Europe, we've reduced by 45% the amount of energy on the left-hand side there, 55% from the volatile organics, uh, which is coming from the painting shop, and 56% from the water. But on the right-hand side, you can see where we are in comp comparison to our competitors. And this is official data. I can't name each individual company, but this is the average. So 42% uh, less water, we're, uh, sorry, energy that we're using, and so on down, down the bottom. And even waste there, you see 67% less waste that is coming out of our factories than uh, our, our competitors. And of course, we have zero waste to landfill as well. So we're making use of, of that waste, even if uh, it has to be combusted uh, and energy recovered. Challenge five is about recycling. And uh, what does that mean? Three basic areas here. We want to manage resources very well. So we heard several times during the course of today <coughs> about uh, how to use resources very effectively, how to minimize the amount that we're using at the starting point. But then, we want to go into this circular economy, as the European Union calls it, but uh, using materials, possibly including natural materials, uh, going through in the use, but making sure that during the, uh, we take care of the car during the lifetime, making sure that we're reusing and recycling as much as we can. And then at the end of it, when a vehicle comes to, uh, uh, to be scrapped, actually adapting our technologies, which we've developed in Japan, uh, to actually do recycling and increasingly do car-to-car -car recycling. So we're trying very hard now to keep uh, uh, recycling at the same level. So if it's from a bumper, it goes back into a bumper rather than into another component that may be hidden. And associated with this part, the technology part, is to uh, share some of that uh, technology that we've got from Japan to the other regions. Just some examples from here. Uh, top left there, you can see that we're using uh, uh, um, <coughs> the latest technologies or partners with the latest technologies for end-of-life vehicle. That's post-shredder treatment. You can see that happens after we've uh, depolluted the vehicle. In the center there, remanufactured parts, we've got around 7,000 uh, production line, uh, uh, product uh, numbers now, which are remanufactured materials. So typically electrical components like alternators and starters, brake pads, uh, sorry, brake, not brake pads, brake calipers, uh, turbos, and things like that. Um, for batteries, uh, we are uh, recycling all of the batteries uh, in accordance with the law, but uh, the, in the bottom left there, you can see some of activity in the US where they've collected a load of batteries together and made a demonstration project at Yellowstone Park, and now Yellowstone Park is completely off-grid uh, using the batteries as a backup supply <coughs> charged by renewable energy. 
zero waste of landfill we've mentioned. These two here, world first, as far as we understand. So we're looking at how to uh, recover the magnets out of the motors that uh, we are using within the hybrid vehicles and returning those back as magnets again into, uh, into new vehicles. And this one here, surprisingly enough, but it is uh, wiring harnesses, it's copper to copper uh, going back into wiring harnesses themselves. And uh, we make a, a deliberate effort to make the wiring harness easily extractable so uh, the uh, scrap man can, can pull the wire harness out and then the, the, the copper value can be retained. The sixth challenge is about working in harmony with nature. And honestly speaking, we've got three activities here. One is called Toyota Greenwave, where we want to be using our own sites and trying to connect those together in terms of uh, corridors for uh, nature, shall we say. And uh, we work, work with our group uh, companies, but also we're increasingly in other regions of the world. We have to work with NGOs, the local commune or whatever to make sure that our system is fitting in with their, their local activities. To, uh, today for tomorrow is, is particular projects which we are undertaking with NGOs to try and put this forward. We just signed a contract for five years with the International Union of Conservation for Nature and we're contributing now for their advancement of the red list, which is the uh, list that identifies threatened species. Again, this is something maybe that's rather unusual for a car company to get involved with. And the other one here, which was, uh, would appeal to Gunter this morning, is, is talking about appealing to the younger uh, element and uh, uh, education for sustainable development. So what are we doing at the moment? Just some brief examples. Our um, sales company down in, in Surrey and Toyota UK are involved in greening the site, bringing trees and uh, shrubs and what have you closer to the, uh, uh, to the plant but specifically chosen to uh, increase wildlife. And you can see here at the top uh, is an is a infographic which we're using with the members. And they, they, at the last count, they managed to count 401 different species uh, which were present on the site, including some red list species which hadn't been spotted in, uh, in Derbyshire before. We get some recognition from that. You can see businesses and community. That's sponsored by Prince Charles. And this one here is where we're working with Kew. You'll be familiar with Kew if you've uh, lived in the UK for a while. There's the Royal Botanic Gardens and the Foundation for Environmental Education. And we've developed uh, some training which was uh, uh, originally developed for the UK by Kew, but only ever used in the UK and India. So we've now translated that now and we're using that. We call it Yokoten, finding best practice and sharing it with, with others. And we've launched that now in 10 uh, new uh, countries, and we've now got around 34,000 students enrolled in that uh, training program this year. One thing I want to mention is, though, it's all human, and there's, there's three C's to think about. Communication, communication, and communication. It's very important to actually uh, uh, be getting people's ownership. And before, we, we struggled, to be honest. How do you get this type of subject onto the agenda if it's not contributing so clearly to the bottom line in terms of uh, uh, cost reduction or something like that? But because these challenges came out, they came out from a very top level, and they've been explained in a very public area, they're on everybody's agenda now. They're on everybody's objectives. So at, we had no problem at all getting our top three in Europe to sign up to those challenges uh, for our Green Month, which we hold during uh, June. And uh, it's just a, a real note to self, basically. You need that uh, top-down pressure as well as your sideways pressure in the organization to get things going. So, just to end here, really, is say, why are we doing this? And this is a quotation. Because it's needed for society. It's our responsibility towards the next generation. We have to be successful business in 2050, and we will not be successful if we do not continue to be a leader in the environmental aspect. This is how much uh, it's considered within the organization. And this is Didier Loire. He was formerly our president and CEO. He's now the executive vice president of Toyota Globally. So he's setting down from God as far as we're concerned. And uh, he, he actually made this presentation at a supplier. So, well, one of our partners, sorry, one of the sales company partners. So he's actually saying this uh, in a very public way. So again, we've got uh, top management support. Okay, so thank you very much.